Okay, so we're doing Psalm 5. Next week we'll be doing Psalm 6, and then we're getting on to 2 Corinthians, okay? Now, what's interesting about Psalm 5, um, it's not a psalm people like to preach on, <laughs> all right? Psalm 5 is definitely not a psalm. I mean, there are a number of psalms that people don't like to preach on, okay? Now, the advantage of us as a church going chapter by chapter through, you know, books of the Bible is that we're going to get to passages that I may not want to preach on, or other pastors may not want to preach on. But if we have a steady, consistent way of preaching the Bible, coming to church and hearing the Word of God, we're going to hear things that are going to be unpleasant to our ears, right? But it doesn't matter if it's pleasant. It doesn't matter if it's uh, pleasant or unpleasant, in season or out of season, in fashion or out of fashion. It doesn't matter. If it's in the Word of God, it must be preached, right? And the biggest advantage we have of going chapter by chapter is we're going to make sure that we don't just, you don't hear preaching of my prejudice, or I just think, oh, maybe the church will be offended by this. I better not preach that. Hey, I've got no choice. I've already committed to the Lord that I'm going to preach the, Bi the whole Bible as much as I can. And when we get to a psalm like Psalm number 5, I'm not going to skip it. Okay? Because it's the Word of God. I mean, what right do I have to say we're going to skip certain parts of the Bible if it makes us uncomfortable? Okay? Now, look at Psalm chapter 5. Verse 5 was the memory verse. The foolish shall not stand in thy sight. Thou hatest all workers of iniquity. The title of the sermon this morning is Workers of Iniquity. Workers of Iniquity. And how does God feel about workers of iniquity? What does the Bible say? Do I have to spell it out? It says he hates them. Today we're going to be talking about the hatred of God. And I'm sorry, you know, I mean, look, I'm not sorry. It's the Bible, okay? If we want to know who God is... If we want to know what his word says, we have to accept the fact that God hates. We love that God loves. And I love the fact that God loves. I love that he's merciful. I love that he's long-suffering. Okay? But there's another reality of God that we must accept, and we can't just throw this out. That he hates, that he's angry, that he's vengeful, and that he has wrath. And hey, what's the ultimate end of that? It's hell. Okay? How many people out there, when you knock on the door, don't want to believe in hell? They don't want to believe in a God that would send sinners and workers of iniquity to hell. Okay? But hey, that's why we go door to door and preach the gospel. Because we believe in God's anger. We believe in God's hatred. We believe in this ultimate destination called hell. And we want to deliver them with the love that God has brought to them as well. Okay? We need to make sure we have a balance. Yes, God is love. That's what we love to hear. But God also has hatred. And we need to understand this if we're going to truly appreciate His love. Okay, let's start with verse number one. Psalm 5, verse 1. Give ear to my words, O Lord, consider my meditation. So this is the Psalm of David. And of course, we saw in Psalm 4 the need to pray. Here it is, David again going to the Lord in prayer. Now he says to, uh, in verse number 2, he says, Hearken unto the voice of my cry. What, what does it mean to cry? Okay, it means to pray out loud, right? It, now, this is David's way of praying sometimes, right? You know, sometimes we pray inwardly, quietly. Sometimes you may pray uh, with your voice. But David says, hey, there's a time where I will cry unto the Lord. He's, he's praying loudly. Okay? He has such a burden on his heart that he feels he needs to cry to the Lord. And he asks God, he says, God, his king, my king and my God, hearken unto the voice of my cry, my king and my God, for unto thee will I pray. Who does David pray to? To the Virgin Mary? To the saints of the Catholic Church? You know, to long dead ancestors? No, he says, I direct my prayers unto God. And I love how he calls God my king. Because this is King David. And he says, I, I have a king. I'm not, you know, he doesn't think of himself so high and mighty. He recognizes that he has his own king, being the Lord God. Hey, and it's fine for you to sometimes vent and cry loudly to the Lord. You know, maybe you don't want to do it in a public place. It's probably not the right place to do it. Find somewhere quiet. There's a lot of empty land around here on the Sunshine Coast. Find somewhere quiet where no one is. And sometimes it's healthy to cry unto the Lord. And what we see here, the reason he's crying is because there are workers of iniquity. And he knows that the Lord hates them. And he knows that the Lord's going to destroy them. Okay, And so he's getting this off his chest. Look at verse number 3. My voice shall thou hear in the morning, O Lord. In the morning will I direct my prayer unto thee, and I will look up. 
So we saw Psalm number four. That was an evening prayer. Just before he lays himself to sleep, he's praying to the Lord. He also has the habit of waking up in the morning. He directs his prayers in the morning. And again, just repeat what I said last week. We ought to wake up in the morning and pray to the Lord. We ought to pray to him before we go to sleep. And we ought to pray continually throughout the day as well. Okay? We should never cease from praying, but it's good practice. Start your day with the Lord and end your day with the Lord. Now let's look at verse number four. This is another attribute of God that people don't like to think about. Verse number four. For thou art not a God that hath pleasure in wickedness. So we, we like that part, right? He has no pleasure in wickedness, neither shall evil dwell with thee. Okay? Now, I, what I want to clarify here is that it's saying that God has no pleasure. He, he doesn't like wickedness, whatever, at all. And then it says, neither shall evil dwell with thee. Now, one thing I need you to understand, if you're going to read the Bible and rightly divide the Word of God, you need to understand that evil is not always a sin. Okay? You need to understand that sometimes God does evil himself. And that, that might sound unusual to you, like especially if you've not heard preaching from the Bible. Okay? Now, let me just give you some examples of this. Well, actually, let me explain verse 4 first, before you think I've gone crazy. Let me explain verse 4. The reason no evil dwells with God is because the first part of that verse says that he has no pleasure in wickedness. So the evil that God does not do is evil from wickedness. Okay? But sometimes God will do evil, but it's evil done in the name of righteousness. Okay? Now again, people don't understand this because they equate evil with sin. Now, sin is evil, but not all evil is sin. Okay? Let me give you some examples of this. Ex I'll just read to you some passages very quickly. You don't need to turn there. But Exodus 32 verse 14. Um, if you remember the story, Israel had worshipped that golden calf. And remember how God got angry. Right? And Moses got angry. He took those tablets and he threw them down and broke them. And then God says that he's going to destroy the people of Israel in Exodus 32. But then in verse 14, and, and Moses is appealing to God, please, please don't kill your people. What are people going to say? You've delivered them out of Egypt, now you're going to destroy them. And well, by Moses' prayer and intercession, it says in verse 14, and the Lord repented of the evil which he thought to do unto his people. So the Lord had planned to do evil unto his people. Now this explains, well, does God sin? Well, of course God doesn't sin. So what does evil mean? If someone's going to do evil to you, it means they're going to harm you. It means they're going to uh, do something that's going to injure you. Okay? Evil in the Bible just means harm or injury. Okay? Now I can cause harm to you, Let's say, let's say I just came up to you and just beat you up. I caused damage for no reason whatsoever. I just don't like you. I beat you up. I've harmed you, right? I've, I've, I've done that out of wickedness. I've done evil out of wickedness. But what if, what if you broke into my house, right? And I had fear that you're going to hurt my family. And out of self-defense, I, I beat you then. I've done evil to you. I've caused harm against you. But I have, that, have I done that out of wickedness? Or have I done that out of righteousness? I've done that out of righteousness. I've done it for a reason, to protect my family, to protect myself. Someone that's breaking into my house, I don't know what they're going to do, right? So doing harm to someone is not always sin. Now think about the laws of God. How many times does he ask people, because of certain sins, that they, they take a beating? That's harm. That's evil. Or that they'd put, be put to death, right? Murderers ought to be put to death. Adulterers in the Bible were to be put to death, right? I mean, this is evil being done to people, but it's not being done out of wickedness. It's being done out of God's righteousness, God's perfect judgment that he passes on crime. Okay? Now, let me give you some other examples. You remember King Saul? When King Saul had turned against God, in 1 Samuel 16, verse 14, it says, But the Spirit of the Lord departed from Saul, and an evil spirit from, from the Lord troubled him. An evil spirit from the Lord troubled Saul. So did he send a devil to trouble Saul? No, he sent an evil spirit, a spirit that would cause him 
um, harm, a spirit that would cause him distress. That's what God replaced uh, King Saul with, okay? That evil spirit. It's from the Lord, okay? Let me give you another example. Um, in 2 Kings twenty two sixteen, it says, Thus saith the Lord. What does the Lord say? Behold, I will bring evil upon this place and upon the inhabitants thereof. Okay? And let me just read to you Isaiah 45, verse 7. This is God speaking. He says, I form the light and create darkness. I make peace and create evil. I, the Lord, do all these things. So who creates evil? The Lord does. Now, some people have misunderstood this and said, well, does God create sin? No. The sin is breaking of God's laws. But God does pass evil judgment on wickedness. Okay? So we need to accept that God does do evil, but when he does evil, we're not talking about sin. We're talking about harm out of his righteous judgment. Okay? So when we read Psalm, and this is important because... I'm just giving you some examples. You're going to find many times in the Bible where God does evil, and you'll be like, what's that about? If you think it's sin, if you think that's talking about sin, you're going to struggle with that, which is why you have to rightly divide evil that is done out of righteousness and evil that is done out of wickedness. So if we go back to Psalm 5 and look at verse number, verse number 4 again, with that in mind, let's read it again. For thou art not a God that hath pleasure in wickedness, neither shall evil dwell with thee. So what's that evil that doesn't dwell with God? Evil out of wickedness. Okay, and if I haven't explained that well enough, please ask me later on, okay? Look at verse number five. Verse number five. The foolish shall not stand in thy sight. Thou hatest all... Can God hate? Some people think hate is a sin. Does God have sin? Of course not, Okay. But it says here, thou hatest all workers of iniquity. That's what the Bible says. I'm not here putting my words into the Word of God. This is what the Word of God says, that he hates all workers of iniquity. But the first part says, the foolish shall not stand in thy sight. Now, I don't know if you guys know of a man called Stephen Fry. Stephen Fry, he's an English homosexual and celebrity. Okay, an English homosexual and celebrity. And I remember watching an uh, um, uh, interview on the internet where someone, he's an atheist, by the way, he, so, so well, he says he's an atheist, okay? And he gets asked, if you, if you met God, if you did actually meet God, what would you say to God? Okay, now let me just give you a snippet of what he says. What he says, what he thinks he's going to say to God, right, when he, when he meets him. This is, these are his words to God. How dare you? How dare you create a world to which there is such misery that is not our fault? Not our fault? <laughs> this guy's a homosexual. This guy's one of the worst sinners that there are. And he says, not my fault. He goes, it's not right. This is what he's telling God. It's not right. It's utterly, utterly evil. But does God do evil? Absolutely. This guy doesn't know God. He thinks God is this Santa Claus in heaven that should just do good all the time. But there's going to be a time when he passes evil on the workers of iniquity. This man, Stephen Fry, thinks he's going to stand in, in God, before God and say these words to God. No chance whatsoever. This man's going to be utterly destroyed in the presence of God. Okay? He's going to, those knees of his will bow and he's going to admit that Jesus Christ is the Lord and this guy's not an atheist. If he feels this way about God, he knows God exists. He just hates God. Right. He just hates God. Okay? And then he says, he says this later on in the same interview. He says, so atheism is not just about not believing there's a God, but on the assumption that there is one, what kind of God is he? What? <laughs> Have you ever heard an atheist say that? You know, it's not just not believing, but we assume if there is, what kind of God is he? I mean, <laughs> that's not atheism. You know, these, these atheists, they know God exists. It doesn't matter what they say or how they act. They know God exists and they're angry at him because they know God does not tolerate their sin and their wickedness. Okay? God hates all workers of iniquity. Now, let's look at um, verse number six. 
And by the way, you, you might say, Kevin, don't we all do iniquity? Because iniquity sometimes you can use that as sin. Yeah, look, we're all sinners. Okay? I'm, not hiding, I'm not trying to say that I'm this righteous man that, that never has worked iniquity in, our, in my life. But one thing you'll notice in the Bible is a difference between just your average sinner. Because when you think about this world, when you think about people you interact with that are not believers, you know, they're not necessarily just outward wicked, wicked people. They're just your common person, just trying to get through life, just trying to do the best they can. And because they have a sin nature, they commit all kinds of sins, as we did, as we did before we came to know the Lord Jesus Christ. But there is a certain classification of people that God calls workers of iniquity. Okay? And I'm not necessarily saying these are reprobates. Okay? But these are people that are so wicked that God has to turn around and say, I hate them. I hate them all. Okay? Now, look at verse number 6. Verse number 6. Just in case you think, well, maybe I've taken that verse out of context. Verse number 6. This is David speaking to the Lord. Thou shalt destroy them that speak least in, those that speak lies and make false assumptions, false rumors. The Lord will what? The Lord will abhor the bloody and deceitful man. Now, if you're uncomfortable with God hating, well, do you, are you comfortable with God abhorring? What does it mean to abhor something? It's extreme hatred. It's not just your standard hatred. It's extreme hatred. God abhors the bloody people that are murderous, people that have blood in their hands, and deceitful man. So I want to bring some points to you right now, okay? We're talking about workers of iniquity. That's the, that's the, that's the theme of this, this um, psalm. But number one, the first point, and I already discussed, is I want you to understand that God hates all workers of iniquity. Yes, God has the ability to hate. The reason why you have the ability to hate and get angry and get upset, but also have the joy and have the love and all those kind of um, qualities in your emotions and in who you are, is because God created you in His own image. Okay? The reason you can experience emotions is because God experienced those emotions. All it takes is a reading of the Bible, and you sh you'll see that God has a range of emotions. And that's why I don't believe emotions are a sin in of themselves. Okay? Emotions are not a sin in of themselves. Now, if I love the things that God loves, that's righteous. If I hate the things that God hates, that's righteous. There's nothing wrong in that. But if I love the things that God hates, and I hate the things that God loves, then I am sinning. Right? But the emotion in of itself is not a sin. Sometimes people get angry, they get upset, and they think, oh, I'm sinning. Well, no, you're just, you're just reacting to a situation. Now, how you react to that situation may be a sin, or you may, be do, you may do what's right. Okay? I haven't preached any emotions, but again, I think that's a misunderstanding amongst a lot of believers. They think if I feel a certain way, I somehow I'm sinning. No, they're just emotions that God has given you so you can react in the proper and correct way. But God... Hates and hate is a quality of God, but God has perfect righteous hatred. Okay, and again, this is an unknown quality to most Christians. Most Christians, if you ask them, just your average believer out there, Christian, does God hate? No, of course not. God doesn't hate, God doesn't hate anyone, right? And what they'll often quote is Gandhi Mahatma Gandhi, Mahatma Gandhi, who knows Mahatma Gandhi? He was a pretty prominent person in the... Well, he's passed away now. I think he passed away in the, the 70s, I think it was, 70s, 80s. He was a pretty prominent Hindu man, okay, like for um, human rights. I mean, look, he did a lot of good, don't get me wrong. I mean, he obviously did a lot of good, but at the same time, he was not a Christian. And he came up with this quote, love the sinner, but hate the sin. Love the sinner and hate the sin. And how many Christians do you know that quote this? Okay? Now... It's true that God loves sinners. It's true that God hates sin. But it's also true that God hates workers of iniquity. Okay, why are we taking the quote of a Hindu man rather than the words of King David? King David, who's a man after God's own heart. A, a man who's seeking God's heart. He wants to love what God loves. He wants to hate what God hates. Don't we want to quote King David instead? Psalm 5, 5, memorize it. Quote King David. Don't quote Gandhi. Okay? And this is why Christians today think there's something wrong with hatred. You know? And, and misunderstand what hatred is. Look, hatred's fine 
if you hate the things that God hates. It's fine, okay? Now, this is, let me explain to you, Gandhi, a lot of Christians try to preach to Gandhi. And this is, what, this is Gandhi's summary of what the Christians taught. And what I'll show you here is that God did send genuine believers, true believers preaching the true gospel to Gandhi in an effort to get this man saved. And I'm going to read to you a quick extract of his summary of what the Christian said to him, a Christian missionary. This is what the Christian missionary said to Gandhi, out of Gandhi's mouth, out of Gandhi's summary. You cannot understand the beauty of our religion. From what you say, it appears that you must be brooding over your transgressions every moment of your life, always mending them and atoning for them. How can this ceaseless cycle of action bring you redemption? You can never have peace. You admit that we're all sinners. Now look at the, perf the perfection of our belief. Our attempts at improvement and atonement are futile, and yet redemption we must have. How can we bear the burden of sin? We can, but throw it on Jesus. He is the only sinless Son of God. It is His Word that those who believe in Him shall have everlasting life. Therein lies God's infinite mercy. And as we believe in the atonement of Jesus, our own sins do not bind us. Sin we must. It is impossible to live in this world sinless. And therefore Jesus suffered and atoned for all the sins of mankind. Only he who accepts his great redemption can have eternal peace. Eternal, by the way. Eternal peace. Think what a life of restlessness is yours and what a promise of peace we have. Isn't that a great summary of, of what we believe as, as believers? This guy has no excuse on the day of judgment to say, well, I never heard the gospel. He even understands it. He, he explains the gospel better than most Christians and preach the gospel. Most Christians say, well, you've got to clean up your life. You've got to go to church. You've got to show some works in order for me to classify you as saved. He says, no, just believe in Jesus. He's paid. He's the perfect son of God. He took on your sins. You can have peace. You can stop atoning for your own sins and just trust Jesus has done it for you. This is how he responds. And these, again, Gandhi's own words. The argument utterly failed to convince me. I humbly, rep I humbly replied. <laughs> I mean, who says about that about themselves? I mean, you know, instead of just saying, I replied, he goes, I humbly, by the way, I'm a humble person, you know, I humbly replied. If this be the Christianity acknowledged by all Christians, I cannot accept it. I do not seek redemption from the consequences of my sin. I seek to be redeemed from sin itself, or rather from the very thought of sin, and until I have obtained that end, I shall be content to be restless. This man goes, I just want to pay for my own sins. I mean, he's paying for his own sins right now in hell. Okay? He's doing it right now. This is the man that you want to quote, the guy that rejects the gospel that was preached to him. And he says, what does it say? Love the, the sinner, hate the sin, or hate the sin and love the sinner. But then this is what he says about Christians. This is what he says. This is his own words. He says, I love your Christ, but I hate your Christians because your Christians are unlike your Christ. So he says, I love Jesus. I love, I love the Jesus that I read about in the Bible, but I hate Christians. And he's the one quoting, you know, love the sinner. <laughs> so, I mean, this guy's just contradictive anyway. And you want to quote this guy rather than quote King David? You know, that's, that's just ridiculous, right? Or even Master Yoda. Master Yoda of Star Wars, right? And I don't know if this is a, a, a right quote, but hate is the pathway to the dark side. That's what Christians are quoting these days, right? You'd rather quote Gandhi, you'd rather quote Master Yoda than quote King David. What, this is not Christianity that you're quoting. You're quoting the force, you're quoting Hinduism, okay? You're quoting something, you're, you're, you're creating a God of your own imagination rather than facing the fact of who God is, that he hates all workers of iniquity. Let me just read some other verses to you now, quickly. Um, I guess you're in Psalms, so you can turn here if you want. Psalms 10, verse 3. Psalm 10, verse 3. Psalm 10, verse 3. For the wicked boasteth of his heart's desire, and blesseth the covetous, whom the Lord abhorreth. God abhors, strongly hates the covetous. Right? The wicked. Psalm 53, verse 5. Psalm 53, verse 5. Psalm 53, verse 5. 
There were they in great fear, where no fear was, for God hath scattered the bones of him that encampeth against him. Thou hast put them to shame, because God hath despised them. What does it mean to despise? You hate them. Okay? And you might say, well, well Kevin here, this, this is just David. And this is what you hear, right? It's just, look, sometimes David just got a little out of, out of hand. You know, God decided to just capture what he, how he felt. But David was wrong to feel this way. I've heard that, right? It's just, it's just David. This isn't how, really how God feels. It's just how David, you know, was venting and he felt this is how God feels at the time. I'll just read to you a couple of other verses. You don't need to turn there. Go back to Psalm 5. But I'll just, I'll just read to you Leviticus 20:23. 20, and you shall not walk in the manners of the nation which I cast out before you. For they committed all these things, and therefore I abhor them. This is Leviticus. Who wrote Leviticus? Moses. Deuteronomy 32, 19. And when the Lord saw it, he abhorred them because of the provoking of his sons and of his daughters. You can't just say, well, this is just David. Well, it's just Moses then, is it? It's just Moses as well, is it? It's David and Moses. I mean, these guys are just messed up, are they? Or are you messed up? Are you believing in Yoda and Gandhi? You know? Hosea 9.15. Hosea 9.15 says, All their wickedness is in Gilgal, for there I hated them. I just, just Hosea. It's just Hosea. I hated them. For the wickedness of their doings, I will drive them out of mine house. I will love them no more. I don't just hate them. I'm, gonna, I'm never going to love them again. I will love them no more. All their princes are revolters. Do you think God can get to a point where he just stops loving, hates you, and will never love you again? That's what the Bible says. Do you want me to just explain this away, you know, f you know for the itching of our ears, because we want God to be Santa Claus, you know? God hates, can hate people to the point that he'll never love them again. Now, the second point is this. First point, that God hates all workers of iniquity. Next point, actually go to Psalm 14. I should have told you to go to Psalm 14. Because we want to understand who the workers of iniquity are, okay? And again, I just believe these are just extremely wicked sinners. We're all sinners. Everyone's a sinner. But these are just extreme sinners. And it can cover the reprobates, okay? But I don't necessarily believe all workers of iniquity are reprobates. Okay, and I will be preaching on reprobates on Thursday. Okay, and it's not because, you know, I'm trying to respond to anyone or anything like that. It's because I think Psalm 5 is a good lead-in to the reprobate doctrine. Because I think one of the reasons why people reject the doctrine of reprobates is, first of all, they just don't even understand that God can hate anyone. Okay, and that's why Psalm 5 is just a great introduction to see how the Lord feels about certain things here. But Psalm 14 verse 4, it actually... I won't read Psalm 14, verse 4. I'm going to read from Psalm 53, verse 4. Psalm 53, just out, just out of interest. I'm going to read Psalm 53, 4. You guys stay in Psalm 14, 4. And as I read 53, 4, you follow 14, 4. Okay? Psalm 53, 4. Have the workers of iniquity no knowledge, who eat up my people as they eat bread? They have not called upon God. How's that next to Psalm 14, 4? In fact, if you look at Psalm 53 and Psalm 14, they're almost identical. It's almost like literally the identical psalm. A little bit of differences, but identical psalms. Um, but the point I want to bring out of that is this. That in workers of iniquity are trying to eat up the people of God as bread. What does that mean? They're trying to consume God's people. They're trying to destroy God's people. The second point that I have is that workers of iniquity hate believers. And what did Gandhi say? I hate Christians. It, then what does that make him? A worker of iniquity. He, I humbly reply. He thinks he's righteous. He thinks he's atoning for his sins. God says, hey, you're a worker of iniquity because you hate my people. Okay? Now, if you go to Psalm 141, Psalm 141, 141, verse 9. Psalm 141, verse 9. It says, keep me from the snares. What's a snare? A trap. Keep me from the snares which they have laid for me. Who are trying to trap Christians? Who are trying to harm Christians? And the jinns, that's another word for trap or snare, 
and the gins of the workers of iniquity who are trying to persecute Christians, who are trying to destroy and trap Christians, the workers of iniquity. Do you understand why God hates them? Because they hate His people. Okay, They hate the people of God. That's my second point, that workers of iniquity hate believers. So the point I want to just, just a practical implication there, is don't hang around workers of iniquity. If you have friends that are so wicked, and you're trying to be friendly to them, hey, stay away, because they're trying to hurt you. They're going to hate you, and they're going to try to hurt you. Point number three, and go to Matthew 7. Matthew 7 is a very common passage that a lot of people turn to. A lot of people turn to this, but they don't understand it. Matthew 7, Matthew 7, verse 21. Matthew 7, verse 21. The third point I have is that workers of iniquity teach false gospels. Okay? They teach false gospels. If you go to a pastor, you go to a church, and the pastor behind the pulpit may appear to be this beautiful, wonderful guy. I mean, what, what can Satan turn himself into, by the way? You know, ministers you know, you know, of light, right? They look beautiful, they look wonderful, they seem to say a lot of truth. But if they're preaching a false gospel, God says they're workers of iniquity. Let's look at Psalm, I mean, Matthew 7, Matthew 7, verse 21. A lot of people quote this. And it's funny because when we say, hey, salvation is just by faith alone, people say, well, hold on, because God says, some will say, Lord, Lord, and God says, I never knew you. <laughs> like, like, that's referring to us, right? Look at Psalm 7, verse 21. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father, which is in heaven. Okay? Now, what is God? God's not willing that any should perish, but should, that all should come to repentance. Okay, so when it comes to entering into the kingdom of heaven, how, what do we need to do to do the will of the Father? To believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, right? Amen. Now, so what we take out of this is there, there are people that say they're Christians, that say Lord Jesus, but they uh, will not enter into the kingdom of heaven. Look at verse 22. Who are these people? Many will say to me in that day, I'm assuming that's a day of judgment, when they're standing before the Lord, 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 have we not prophesied in thy name? So they're preachers. They preach the Lord Jesus Christ. All right? They, they say Jesus. And in thy name have cast out devils. Now, this used to confuse me. I'm thinking, hold on. If they're casting out devils, because remember when, 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 when Jesus cast out a devil out of man and they said, oh, you, you're doing this out of the power of Satan? And God says, well, no, how can Satan cast out Satan? Right? So if there are people, because then his kingdom will fall. And I was thinking, how can these people cast out devils but not be going to heaven? Don't you do that because you have the power of God with you? But they're not... The passage doesn't say here that they've cast out devils. They're saying they've cast out devils in the name of Jesus Christ. Okay? It's not saying they did cast out devils. They're just saying they cast out... Think about... I can think of a lot of people, a lot of faiths, a lot of so-called Christians that claim they're casting out devils. All right? But they haven't. They're just saying they have, right? They're just saying they have, but they're not believers. Look at this. So they, they've preached, they say they've cast out devils, and in thy name have done what? Many wonderful works. So what do they believe they need to do to inherit the kingdom of God? What do they believe they need to do to go to heaven and be saved? They believe they have to do many wonderful works. These people are trusting in their works. They're trusting in, hey, I preach your name, Jesus. I cast out devils in your name, Jesus. I've done many wonderful works. Sounds good to us, I guess. But then look at verse number 23. And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. These workers of iniquity are trusting in their works. They're preachers. They're casting out devils, so-called. These people are workers of iniquity. Be careful of the churches that you join and the men that you listen to, okay? Because they might be doing the wonderful works. But God says, no, you're a worker of iniquity because you preach a false works-based gospel, okay? Turn to Luke 13. Luke 13, 23. Luke 13, 23.
I better hurry up. Luke 13, 23. And this is about salvation again. Then said one unto him, Lord, are there few that be saved? You know, is it just a few that's, that's saved? And he said unto them, Strive to enter in at the straight gate. What does it mean to be straight to the narrow gate, okay? For many, I say unto you, will seek to enter in and shall not be able. Verse 25. Why are, they not, why are these people not able to enter in? What are they trusting in to be righteous before God? We'll see this soon. Verse 25. When once the master of the house is risen up and have shut the door, and you begin to stand without and to knock at the door, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. And he shall answer and say unto you, I know you not whence you are. I don't know where you're from. I don't know who you are. Kind of like what we read in Matthew 7. 26. Then shall ye begin to say, We have eaten and drunk in thy presence, and thou hast taught in our streets. Who are these people? They have not entered into the straight gate. Into the straight way there. The straight gate. Who are these people? They're saying, Hey, Jesus, when you were on the earth, we were eating there with you. We, we saw you. We saw you preaching. We were with you. Who did Jesus go and preach the gospel to? To the Jews. To Judah, right? These are the people that have missed out on the straight gate. Verse 27. But he shall say, I tell you, I know you not whence ye are. Depart from me, all ye workers of iniquity. And we have a certain element today of people that believe Jews would just, are just righteous before God. They're just people of God, just without Jesus Christ. They can reject Jesus because Jesus came through, he was a Jew just like them, and somehow they're righteous before God. They think their righteousness before God is their DNA, is their blood. They think their righteousness is that they're a descendant of Abraham. But what does Jesus call them? Workers of iniquity. Okay? You can't get to heaven because of your DNA. And let me say, Christ, uh, children, you can't get to heaven if your parents are Christian. You need to yourself believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. You need to make sure that you have personal salvation for yourself. You can't say, well, my dad was the pastor of the church in Caloundra. You need to come to a point where you believe on Jesus Christ and place your faith on him. Okay? God is not a respecter of persons. Okay? If you think you're special and God's just going to accept you because of who you are, forget it. God accepts you because of Jesus Christ. You've got to believe in him to be acceptable to God. Now let's keep reading verse 28. Verse 28. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now look, if you think, well, these are not the Jews. Look at this. When ye shall see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God and you yourselves thrust out. So their forefathers are there. The prophets are there. But they themselves are going to miss out on the kingdom of God. And look at verse 29. Oh, replacement theology. Look at verse 29. And they shall come from the east and from the west and from the north and from the south and shall sit down in the kingdom of God. So who gets to sit down with Abraham, Isaac and Jacob and all the prophets, all the Old Testament saints? Those from everywhere, from the uttermost part of the world. North, south, east, west, everywhere. Chinese, Australian, Chilean. What else have we got here? New Ze who's New Zealand? <laughs> New Zealanders even, okay? New Zealanders are allowed for some reason. You know, from all nations are going to sit in the kingdom of God. I've not replaced Abraham, Isaac or Jacob or all the prophets. We've not replaced any Old Testament saints. In fact, we sit down with the Old Testament saints and we partake with them, okay? Don't get confused when people use this term replacement theology. Look, we're just added. We've been added to the people of God, okay? And it's always been because of faith on Jesus Christ. Always. It's never been about your DNA, Okay? Now, the Jews, they had an advantage because they had the Old Testament prophets, because they had God watching over them and protecting them when they were doing right and being corrected when they were doing wrong. They had the advantage. Okay? But these people think they just have the advantage because of who they are rather than the God that they, they ought to have worshipped and believed in. Okay? So the workers of iniquity teach false gospels, either a works-based gospel or, look at me, I'm special. Hey, that's racism. To put one race above another, that's racism. 
And what I'm teaching you, you know, some people will turn around and say, well, you're anti-Semitic. You're against the Jews. Oh, look, I believe they're the same as anybody else. Amen. They need the gospel as much as anyone else. If you have a heart for the Jews, then go to Israel and preach the gospel. If that's your heart, if you love them above anyone else and you think they're so special, I need to give them the gospel. Hey, they need the gospel. I agree. Amen. Then go to Israel and preach the gospel. But I know too many missionaries that are in Israel that have a heart for the Jews, but they don't preach the gospel. i tell you why they don't preach the gospel. Because it's illegal. Illegal in Israel to preach the gospel. Okay? And if you preach the gospel, you can get, get thrown in jail or whatever. Okay? Now, look. If you have a heart for that, if that's what you believe God wants you to be, then you've got to make a decision. You know, as a missionary in Israel... I can't preach the gospel because I'm going to get arrested and thrown into prison. All right, then go somewhere else. Go somewhere where people will hear the gospel and you're not going to get thrown in jail. Okay? But if you do believe your, your goal is there to be in Israel, then preach the gospel. And if you go to jail, that's part of the consequences. The Lord will reward you. Okay? But don't hold back and say, well, they're just special people anyway. They're going to be saved anyway. I mean, that's just the most ridiculous kind of beliefs out there. That's racism if you withhold the gospel from people because you think they're already accepted by God and they're going to go to hell because of you believing they're special. That's crazy. They need the gospel as much as anyone else. Okay? I'm not anti-Semitic. I'm not racist. In fact, Christina's DNA result came back with some Jewish in her. <laughs> right? So don't tell me I hate my wife. Okay? Anyway, moving on. Point number four the workers of iniquity will be destroyed. And, and I better hurry up, so I'll just read to you Proverbs 10, verse 29. Proverbs 10, 29 says, The way of the Lord is strength to the upright, but destruction shall be to the workers of iniquity. So what's God going to do to the, to the workers of iniquity? Destroy them. That's what's going to come to them. Proverbs, 11, uh, sorry, Proverbs 21, verse 15. It is a joy. It is a joy to the just, to do judgment. Say, like, Kevin, this is very judgmental. This is very hateful preaching. No, it's joyful. To do, for the just to do judgment. But destruction shall be to the workers of iniquity. This is just punishment. Okay? It is something we ought to rejoice in. That God will destroy the wicked. It's going to come. And look, it might be hard now to understand that. But when you have your new resurrected bodies, when you're perfect before God, even bodily, when you no longer have sin, you will actually understand even more so why God has to do this. You will be even more aligned with God's mind. And this is why the Bible t tells us that we have to renew our minds. Okay? Stop thinking like a man and start thinking like God. Start having a will that's more like the will of God. Start loving what God loves and start hating what God hates. This is what's going to keep you more balanced than anything else, okay? More balanced than listening to Yoda and Gandhi. Are you, can you go back to Psalm 5? Psalm 5? Psalm 5 verse 7. Psalm 5 verse 7. I'll try to hurry up. But as for me, he says, look, God, these workers of iniquity, you hate them, right? But verse 7, but as for me, I will come into thy house, as, I'm going to go to church. That's what he's saying, like in the Old Testament language, right? I, as for me, I'm going to be in thy house. I'm going to be in your church. In the multitude of thy mercy and in thy fear will I worship toward the holy temple. Hey, going to church was important for King David. He saw that it was important for him to go and worship the Lord. It, it took him away from the wickedness of this world to be in God's holy house and worship in him, right? And that's how you ought to think of church. You know, don't think of church as a chore. Oh man, it's Sunday already. Do I have to really, oh man, I get ready, get the kids all ready. No, come to church and come to worship the Lord. Okay, come and be in his house because Monday to Friday, Monday to Saturday, you're seeing the wickedness of this world. You need to come to a place where you can just be in God's presence, right? Because God is here. God is here when we're gathered in his name. Church was important to David. Verse number eight. Lead me, O Lord, in thy righteousness because of mine enemies. Make thy way straight before my face. So, you know, David saw the importance to refresh himself, to seek God's path in his life. 
Why? He says, because of mine enemies, because of the persecution that was coming David's way, he saw how important it was for him to be in church in the presence of God, worshipping the Lord. Verse 9, For there is no faithfulness in their mouth. These are the workers of iniquity, his enemies. There's no faithfulness. They're not faithful. They're not trustworthy at all. Their inward part, look at this, their inward part is very wickedness. I mean, wickedness is a bad word. Very wickedness, right? I mean, God, David can see that they're wicked, but obviously he knows that out of the abundance of the heart, right? And he says, look, inside, man, these guys are very wicked. Their throats, so the things that they speak, is an open sepulchre. It's like a grave. It's a tomb. They speak dead things, not profitable. They flatter with their tongue. Hey, be careful with flattery. You know, flattery in the Bible is not a positive term. It's something negative. It's something workers of iniquity do. Don't be a flatterer, okay? Because that's what the wicked do. They try to get on your side and for you to love them and appreciate and accept them, and then they come in with their wickedness. That's how, that's how these, these people try to make friends and how they try to destroy Christians. Um, verse 10. Destroy them. Oh, look, we saw that their end was destruction. Look at verse 10. Destroy thou them, O oh God. Let them fall by their own counsels. What does that mean? They're counseling together for wickedness. David says, hey, let them suffer and, and, and uh, be destroyed by their own counsels, by their own wicked ways. Let them fall by their own wicked ways, right? Rather than the people of God. Cast them out in the multitude of their transgressions, for they have rebelled against thee. You know, give them the full punishment, Lord, for the transgressions that they've done. They hate you. They rebel against you. You know, it is a righteous request. Pay attention now. It is a righteous request for you to go to God and say, God, please destroy the wicked. Okay, I'm not saying you ought to be a vigilante and go, you know, take law into your own hands. Okay, but you can ask the Lord for this. This is a righteous request. Again, we can't, we can't just throw these verses out of the Bible. Oh, it's a different dispensation. It's the same God. Amen. It's the same God of the Bible. Don't give me that dis dis dispensational, oh, different things. You know, you can't apply that today. What's wrong with you? And some might say to me, you know, well, you know, this doctrine, you know, this doctrine of hate God, hating the wicked, this doctrine makes you angry, this doctrine makes you frustrated, it makes you overly critical, it makes you depressed. Not at all. <laughs> Not at all. Look at verse number 11. Look at verse number 11. This is David. After saying, God, please destroy the wicked. What does it say in verse 11? But let all those that put their trust in thee rejoice. <laughs> David's like, hey, I'm just rejoicing, Lord, in you. I'm rejoicing. I'm worshipping you. Let them ever shout for joy because thou defendest them. Let them also that love thy name be joyful in thee. So this psalm that is negative, this psalm that is hateful, how does it end? Three times, was it three times? Uh, let all them that put their trust in thee rejoice. Let them ever shout for joy because thou defendest them. Let them also that love thy name be joyful in thee. Three times in that verse. Hey, I'm full of joy. If, we're, if we love the Lord, we worship him, this ought to give us joy. And at the same time, if we're a balanced Christian, we ought to hate the workers of iniquity. That's just how it goes. The two things can go together. Just because I believe God hates certain people, do you think I'm down all the time? I'm always hateful? Or do you see me pretty pleasant, pretty happy, pretty easygoing? Because right, I'm resting in the Lord. I'm resting that the Lord will take care of the wickedness. It's not my job to do it. Okay? I, I can leave it. In fact, it's the government's job to take care of pe people that are very wicked. Maybe that's something we ought to pray for. That our, our government will bring back laws that will punish wicked people. Because okay? all they get is a slap on the wrist. The people that get punished are the victims. Right? Because they have to you know, put up with uh, uh, judgment that wasn't done appropriately, that what didn't fit the crime. That's something we ought to, that we ought to pray for. Because God has instituted government to punish wicked, wicked people. Uh, verse number 12. For thou, Lord, will bless the righteous. With favor will thou compass him with a shield. So God will protect his righteous people. We don't need to be afraid. But you know what? It's healthy to go to God with your worries, with your cares, with the people that hate you, people that are trying to hurt you, and go and cry unto the Lord. That, that's, that's the lesson that we see here in Psalm 5. 
Now, in conclusion, in conclusion, there are five reasons this teaching is important. Five reasons this teaching is important. Number one, for you to know the God of the Bible more. Just for you to know who God is. Okay? Because you've heard of God is love. And I'm not, it's true. 100% true. Amen. Okay? You've heard all of that. But how many times have you heard that God hates the workers of iniquity? I mean, honestly, how many times have you heard that? I, I probably can't even think of once I've heard that preached. Right? I'm, I'm talking about in a church that I've sat down and attended. Okay? Number one, you get to know God more. Okay? Many preachers refuge, refuse to acknowledge God's hatred because they don't know what hatred is. They don't think of this, that there's, there's hatred that can be righteous and can be just that comes from God. Okay? That's number one. The second reason this teaching, <coughs> this teaching is important is for you to stay away from, from making friends that are workers of iniquity. Stay away from friends. Even if you've grown up with friends your whole life, and you care for them, but they've turned into some wicked, evil people, stay away from them. They're going to try to hurt you if you're a believer. Okay? They're going to hurt you. They seek to destroy you. I'll just read to you Psalm 140. Maybe you can turn there if you're still in Psalm. Psalm 141, verse 3. Psalm 141, 141, verse 3. Psalm 141, verse 3. He says, <clears throat> Set a watch, O Lord, before my mouth. Keep the door of my lips. Incline not my heart to do any evil thing, to practice wicked works with men that work iniquity. And let me not eat of their dainties, of their delicacies. Is that what that word means? So he's saying, look, help me, Lord, to not be influenced by the workers of iniquity. Do you see that? To practice the wicked works of the men that work iniquity. Because David knows, or I don't know if it's David, the writer this psalm, but he knows that if I hang around workers of iniquity, it's going to rub off on me, and I'm going to start to do the wicked things that these people do. So stay away from making friends that are workers of iniquity. Uh, the third reason why this teaching is important is because when you understand how much God can hate, then that's going to, stop, that's going to help you overcome iniquity in your own life. When you, when you think about certain sins and certain wicked things that you do or you have done in the past, it's going to, when you understand God's holiness and you understand His righteousness, you understand His judgment, and you understand His hatred for the things that you have done in your life, that's going to prevent you from doing that again. That's going to help you live in a more holy life because you know how God feels about that. Okay? Instead of you thinking, well, God's just, gonna, you know, God's just going to be long-suffering with me forever, and, and he is, and he's merciful as a believer. He is merciful and long-suffering, and all that's true. But at the same time, you know, if you understand how much God hates that sin, that's going to be part of the reason why you stop doing that sin. Okay? That's point number three. I'll just read to you Job 31. Job 31, verse 1. Uh, Job says, I made a covenant with mine eyes. Why then should I think upon a maid? Job says, look, I don't want to think about a woman that is not my wife. He makes a covenant with his eyes, makes a promise with his eyes, I'm not going to look or think about another woman. Okay? Then verse number 2 says this, For what portion of God is there from above? And what inheritance of the Almighty is on high? Verse 3, Is not destruction to the wicked and a strange punishment to the workers of iniquity? And if you keep reading this, this chapter, you'll see that it's about him looking upon other women. Like, you know, that's that, you know, and, and you ought not to look at other women. You ought not to look at pornography or anything like this. The lust of the eyes. No, you need to make a covenant with your eyes because Job says, if you do this, if you're looking at other women, lusting after, after women that are not your wife, you're a worker of iniquity. This is what workers of iniquity do. They're full of lust. So, to overcome iniquity in your life, you need to understand how much God hates it. Okay? That's going to be important to you overcoming sin in your life. The fourth reason why this is important, this topic is important to preach on, is so you can know that you can vent to God about wickedness in this world. Okay? Because people need to vent from time to time. You know, we live in a wicked world. We live, you know, things go bad. We struggle with certain things. People annoy us. Even Christians can annoy us. You know, sometimes we need to... That's why having a wife and a husband and wife is, is good and important. Because every now and again, you need to get stuff off your chest. You need to vent, right? But we, we, 
How does David vent? Does he go on social media and vent? He goes to God, he cries aloud to the Lord, and he vents to God about all the wickedness that he sees. And at the end of it, he feels a lot better, doesn't he? He's rejoicing in the Lord. Okay? It's good to vent. David does it. You can do it. Vent to the Lord Jesus Christ. Speak to God. Okay? Uh, and point number five, why this is important to understand God's hatred. The last point is so you can fully appreciate God's love and sacrifice. Fully appreciate it. Because if God was just love, everything's just love, then what's really, I mean, what's the value? I mean, yeah, he died for us. That's, that's a loving thing, right? But when you realize how much God hates wickedness, how much he hates iniquity, right? And Romans 5, 8, this is one we use when we go soul winning. You know, but God commendeth his love toward us. What does it mean to commend something? Okay, what's commendable? It means it's worthy of notice. His love is worthy to be noticed. Another way to explain commend is to entrust, to entrust someone with something, right? And when Jesus says, I, into your hands I commend my spirit, he entrusted his spirit to, to the Heavenly Father. But his love is worthy of notice. It's, it's, it's been committed to us, okay? Why? Why is it commendable? But God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. While we're yet sinners, enemies of God, working iniquity in our lives, he came and sent Jesus Christ, his son, to die for us. Amen. You can appreciate that even more, right? Because, I mean, if, if, if we were just trying our best and God says, well, I'll send Jesus to die for them, I mean, that's still great, but how much more when we're doing the wickedness, when we're sinning against him, we're, we're his enemies, we're breaking his laws, and still he has enough love to send Jesus Christ to die for us. I mean, when you understand God's hatred, doesn't it drive you more to love what he's done for us? Doesn't it drive you more to go, hey, I need to get the gospel out to these people. Look at the great sacrifice that Jesus Christ did for those that do iniquity, okay? So it's important. We can't just ignore it. You're going to appreciate his love and his sacrifice so much more when you can understand how much God just hates sin, how much he hates the workers of iniquity. Uh, let's pray. Heavenly Father,